Sophia's fifth letter. Dear Yaristan, your letter was beautiful. I wish I had joined you at the time of the Magarna uprising instead of having Lem take you my silly letters. I have a little bit more in common with you now than I did when I last wrote you. I've just come out of jail. A few days after the so-called general strike, which I attended with Damon, a loud noise woke me at seven in the morning. At first I thought it was thunder. A storm was raging outside. Then I heard it again. A loud, insistent knocking. I ran to the door in a stupor and opened it. Two huge, uniformed policemen stood in front of me, both grasping the handles of the guns in their holsters. Mrs. Natchelow, one of them asked. Miss Natchelow, which one? There are three of us here. My first thought was that something horrible had happened to Tina, who is no longer with us. Miss Sophia Natchelow? That's me, I said. You're under arrest. Me? Why? That's for the court to determine. Anything you say now may be used as evidence against you. Come with us. Can I get dressed, I asked. Don't take all day. Would you mind waiting for me outside, I asked. Not this time, miss. We'll wait right here. Step on it. Could you at least keep your voice down? You'll wake everyone up, I whispered. Just make it snappy, miss, or you'll have to come in the clothes you're wearing. I took my time dressing and tiptoed out of my room so as not to wake Sabina. They were sitting when I came out. They both rushed out of the house after me. Okay, let's go. I started to run back in, asking, can I at least leave a note for my sister? You've taken enough of our time, miss. You can call her from the station. A third policeman was sitting in their car, listening to the radio while waiting for his colleagues to escort me out of the rain. I'd forgotten my umbrella, but I didn't ask for another favor. I got drenched. You've been charged with assault and battery, I was told, in a cold, matter-of-fact manner. It didn't seem to occur to any of them that the charge was ridiculous for a person of my stature. What had they thought when they saw me open the door in my pajamas and barefooted, that I might slug two enormous protectors of law and order? They'd kept their hands on their guns just in case. Maybe they thought I was wiry. Is my victim dying of the injuries I inflicted, I asked, trying to imitate their cold, matter-of-fact tone. All of them, including the driver, turned to look at me. One of them mumbled something more about the court determining the extent of the injuries and about the possibility that my words might turn up as my accusers. They and I were silent for the rest of the trip. I asked for the phone as soon as I got to the station. Everyone I asked was very cordial. I was told I could use the phone right away as soon as I was interviewed and searched. But after I was interviewed once, I was interviewed again. And after I was searched one time, I was searched a second time and then a third. I won't bore you with the details. You must be familiar with them. Police stations all over the world must have more in common with each other than with the neighborhoods in which they're located. It must have been noon before I got to use a phone. I rang and rang, but there was no answer. Of all days to decide to go out before lunch, Sabina had chosen this one. I was escorted to a room full of women sitting on benches. I was furious at myself. How stupid I had been not to wake Sabina. In my early morning stupor, I thought my arrest was so trivial compared to the event that had taken place two days earlier, Tina's departure, that I had even whispered and tiptoed so as not to disturb Sabina's sleep with my silly tragedy. I could at least have written her a note during the time I was alone in my room dressing. How dumb! I felt so frustrated I bit my lip until it bled. My anchor gradually shifted to the sneaky psychology professor who was responsible for my arrest. I have to give him credit for one thing. He certainly is a psyche manipulator. He had grinned when I'd slapped him in response to his intimidating insults. I had interpreted his grin as a sign of masochistic enjoyment, but I'm not a psychologist. His grin was the grimace of the victor. His insult strategy had succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. He had provoked the criminal to enact the crime. He's no masochist. He's a sadist, an ordinary bastard, an agent provocateur for the police. I didn't regret slapping him. In fact, I wish I had done something which deserved the description assault and battery. I wish I had given that morning's policemen some reason to keep their hands on their guns. I wish they had in fact told me that my victim was in critical condition because of the wounds I had inflicted. Various colorful and ingenious forms of assault and battery drifted through my mind, none of which would ever be within my reach, none of which I'd ever be able to carry through. And while I pondered my total inability to torture my torturer, the cracks on the blank wall across from me formed themselves into a smug face with a stupid grin whispering at me through its teeth. Everyone can see that nothing is going to stop you, Miss Natchelow. You're a dangerous person. You should be undergoing treatment in a hospital, Miss Natchelow. Towards evening, we were moved from the room with the benches to a similar room with cots but no blankets. I had been there or in an identical room once before. When trays of food were brought in, I realized I hadn't been given any lunch, but I didn't feel the urge to complain. After supper, I asked to use the phone, but the guard told me I could phone in the morning. 
She turned off the lights and shut the door. I thought we were locked in for the night. I was wrong. Sometime during the dead of night, blinding lights were turned on, and I was one of several women herded out of the building into a van. Barely awake, I asked the woman next to me what was happening. Nothing much, dearie. We're being transferred, she said. Maybe such middle-of-the-night transfers are normal, but for all I knew, we were being taken to the river to be drowned. I was too sleepy to care. I've never familiarized myself with the city's prison system and wouldn't have known where I was if I'd stayed awake in the van. The building to which the van transported us was the classical jail, the castle-like fortified monstrosity which is an architectural and no doubt also social monument to the first cities. The building with the thick stone walls, iron gates, and endless corridors of cells with metal bars. When I was arrested several years ago, I had only been shown the accommodations available in the courthouse building. This was my first visit to the correctional institution, properly speaking. My first impression was favorable. The cot had a neatly folded blanket on it, but I didn't sleep well. The clanging gates, the footsteps on metal floors, and a woman's shriek all conspired to destroy any comfort the blanket might have given me. By the time breakfast was brought to my cell, I was hysterical. I dropped the tray to the floor and shouted my demand to use the telephone. Eventually, two guards escorted me out of my cell into a waiting room, where I was subjected to a medical examination. When that was over, they escorted me back to my cell. I screamed about my rights and threatened to sue the prison authorities. In this, I was somewhat hypocritical. I knew I had the right to use the telephone, but during all my years as a troublemaker, I had never familiarized myself with any of the other rights I might have. I'm not apologizing for my ignorance. I know that prisoners' rights are little more than documents shifted to and fro by legislators and reformers. The physical setup alone precludes a prisoner's having any rights, or as you put it so aptly, the prisoner's rights reside in the humanity of the jailer. Shortly after my examination, one of the guards returned and explained that I couldn't telephone just then because I would soon be up for trial. She seemed convinced that her explanation was perfectly logical, but it failed to pacify me. I continued to shout about my rights. She returned again, intensely annoyed, and at last accompanied me to a telephone. I cursed Sabita for not being home to answer my call. I cursed Tina for having walked out on us just before my arrest. I cursed Damon. He never leaves his house before noon, but that morning he was out. Maybe he and Sabina were out together. The very idea was absurd, yet I later found out that they were in fact out together, looking for me. Out of sheer desperation, I tried Louisa, although I knew she was at work. The guard triumphantly escorted me back to my cell. She has succeeded in pacifying me. It turned out that I was up for trial all day long, and by supper time I was wondering how many days or months I would continue to be up for trial. Some of my wondering can undoubtedly be traced to paranoia, but as you well know, the paranoia is itself grounded in terrible reality. How many have spent their last days waiting for the promised trial? I only had to wait until the following morning. I was roused before sunrise and transferred back to the courthouse, not in the back of a van this time, but in a car's comfortable back seat, which I shared with two other sleepy women. As soon as we reached the courthouse, I started demanding my rights again. An officious clerk with a clipboard enumerated the exact number of telephone calls I had already been allowed. Trying to grab his clipboard, I asked if it showed how many times I had reached anyone. He backed away and returned shortly to tell me I could call my lawyer. I finally reached Sabina. She sounded groggy. I hoped she wouldn't think she had dreamed my phone call. Sophia, where are you? She asked sleepily. We thought she'd been kidnapped. Kidnapped? I was. Two burly policemen kidnapped me and had me locked up. I'm in the courthouse now. I'll call Damon. If I can't reach him, I'll come by cab, she said. I felt lighter. I was even somewhat flattered. They had missed me. The clerk asked, did you reach your lawyer? Yes, thank you, I said. She'll come for me after the trial. He shrugged his shoulders with an, another one of those nuts expression and ordered me to follow him out of the waiting room. I followed him into another world, the world of the courtroom. A black-robed judge was already installed on the almighty God's seat, passing judgment on lowly humans. On both sides of him, divine clerks recorded his every word and gesture. Divine messengers waited to fulfill his every wish and command. Totally unlike my previous courtroom experience, I didn't have to wait all day only to return to court a week later. It was my turn as soon as I entered. My court-appointed lawyer made his way towards me to ask for my name and occupation. The only familiar face in the entire courtroom was the face of my accuser, my colleague, the professor of behavioral psychology. He gave a brief but pungent account of the misfortune that had befallen him. He had come across Miss Natchelo in the hallway of their shared workplace, and they had exchanged a few words. This much was all perfectly normal, and neither my court-appointed defender nor I pointed out that he had never before come across nor exchanged words with Miss Natchelo in their shared workplace. Everything was normal, when suddenly a snake reared its head in paradise, totally unprovoked by any concrete physical deed on his or anyone else's part. 
Miss Naturalo started to inflict physical blows on his innocent person. My presentation didn't match his, either in eloquence or in penetrating behavioral insight. I said he had insulted me, and I had slapped his face as hard as I could. My slapping his face couldn't be described as assault and battery, therefore I was innocent of the charge. I repeated my statement three times, once for my defense, once for my prosecution, and again for the judge. In the judge's view, it was not within my competence to define the nature of my deed, but within his. Since I confessed to a deed which he classified as assault and battery, he found me guilty, fined me, and my trial ended. I saw my accuser's face grimace with dissatisfaction when the judge announced the fine. It was a trivial sum. I paid my fine and rushed out of the courtroom. I pranced up and down the hall, clutching my purse in my left hand, my right hand ready to swing. I vaguely hoped to give my community college colleague a chance to come across Miss Natchelow in a different hallway. Concluding for the second time that he wasn't a masochist, I abandoned my hope and left the courthouse. A familiar car was parked across the street, empty and locked. Damon and Sabina must have gone inside to find me. No easy task, since I hadn't told Sabina where I was going to be tried. I sat down on the hood and waited. The car reminded me of Tina. I hadn't seen Damon since our argument about you and your previous letter, the argument which ended with Tina standing in the street shouting at Damon's vanishing car. I thought of her comment. Some fancy friends you've got, as I sat on the hood of my fancy friend's car. A few days after that argument, Tina had left Sabina and me and my fancy friends. I was intensely upset by Tina's departure, not because it was totally unexpected. Some departures are in my own best style, nor because I had ever thought Tina would remain by my side till the end of my days. On the contrary, I've often thought Sabina and I cramped Tina's development in our own peculiarly insidious ways. What upset me about Tina's departure originates in experiences that took place 11 years ago in that garage I described so briefly in my last letter. Two days before my arrest, Tina failed to leave for work in the morning. I assumed she was taking sick leave and thought the better of her for it. She had been excessively conscientious about her job. But just before lunch, she pulled what must have been all of her things out of the room. Sabina asked, are you moving into the living room? I'm leaving, Tina announced. You could have avoided all questions by leaving at night, Sabina said. I don't have anything to hide, Tina retorted. Are you leaving town or just this house, Sabina asked. Just this house. And your job, I asked. In about a week, they'll figure out that I'm not coming in anymore and they'll hire someone else, Tina answered. Good for you, Sabina said. Do you mind my questions? Yes, I do, Sabina, Tina said sadly, because you'll mind my answers. I know that the only way you'd ever go to a university building would be with a stick of dynamite in your hand. Maybe I'll feel that way too, but if I do, I'd like it to be for my own reason. You've been crutches, both of you, and thanks to you, I haven't learned to walk on my own. At least not very well. Some kids occupied a university building, and inside it they're forming something they call a commune. I'd like to figure out how I feel about that by being part of it. But Tina, I protested, surely you're not taking all your things to a building occupied by its students. Do you expect this commune to last? Tina didn't smile. I'm taking my thing to Ted's. I jumped. To Ted Nasibu's house? Yes, to Ted's, she repeated. He'll be here in five minutes. Couldn't you leave them here, I asked? This is as much your house as anyone else's. It's not a question of leaving my things, Sophia, and I mind your questions, too. I don't know what you've always had against Ted, and I no longer care. I'm not just leaving my things there. I'm moving. I'm going to live in the commune, and I'll be staying at Ted's. At Ted Nazibu's? I asked again, stupidly. I was on the verge of tears. Yes, Sophia, at Ted's. Do you have wax in your ears? Look at the scene you're making. Do you really want me to tell you why I'm leaving? I loved you, both of you, but I've come to hate you. I feel like your prisoner. The university, Ted, what else is taboo? Oh, I know it's not taboo to you. You've had your reasons, but your reasons aren't good enough for me. They don't grow out of my own life. I do things for Sabina's reasons, and I do others for Sophia's, but I never do anything for my own reasons. I don't even know what my own reasons are. And that's all I want right now, to discover my own reasons, to become me, Tina, a human entity, someone who's neither Sophia nor Sabina. I'll wait for Ted in the street. It's getting stuffy in here. Tears rushed to my eyes and I ran to my bedroom while Tina turned around to go outside. I heard Sabina help Tina carry her things out, heard their shouts of goodbye. Then the front door slammed shut and Sabina burst into my room shouting, shame on you, Sophia. I was ashamed only of my uncontrolled crying. You're not bothered in the least, are you, Sabina? I asked, no longer crying. I was bothered by the fact that she spent so many years with us. It's about time she asserted her independence. And you of all people presume, I don't presume anything, I interrupted. You know perfectly well that we've always agreed about that. One and only one thing bothers me. Namely? Namely, Ted Nazibu, I shouted. I was angered by Sabina's mock innocence. 
Sophia, she's her own person, Sabina responded indignantly. You're using Ted to mask your possessiveness. Somewhere along the way, you've acquired a mother complex. That's ridiculous, Sabina, I shouted. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about, and I'm amazed that it still doesn't bother you. Still, Sabina asked, acting puzzled. Have you forgotten that I spent several months in that house behind the garage? I became familiar with everything that happened there, I shouted. Sabina's face hardened. She planted herself in my doorway and stared at me for several minutes. Then she said, really, you'll have to tell me about it sometime. She marched straight to her desk, slamming her door shut. Ghosts. I feel so strange in their presence. For all these years, I prided myself for the open relations Sabina, Tina, and I maintained with each other. Everything was always in the open. None of us ever had anything to hide. Suddenly, a ghost walks out of the closet where we'd locked it for good, and it mocks our hypocrisy with its hideous laughter. The three of us shared an experience 11 years ago, and each one of us was profoundly marked by it. Yet, except for passing references to it, we've never once discussed it nor its significance. Not once during all the eight years we've been together. Yet, if it hadn't been for that trial and its aftermath, I would have been thinking of nothing other than that experience since the day Tina left. I continued thinking about it as soon as the trial ended, sitting on the hood of Damon's car waiting for him and Sabina to emerge from the courthouse. I can't even force myself to go on telling you about my trial before telling you what I experienced behind the garage 11 years ago. I had suppressed every memory of those events for so many years, yet for the past few days the suppressed memories have been coming up like vomit. I don't know anything about the supposed connection between remembering and eating, but I do know that as soon as Tina mentioned Ted, as soon as one element of that repressed experience came up, all the other elements came up behind it. I apologize for having flown so far away from the subject with which I started this letter. Tina's decision to live with Ted is far more important to me than that fancy job I had at the community college. My experience in the garage should in any case be more interesting to you, since you claim that you recognize yourself in the garage world while feeling a complete stranger in my corner of the academic world. I wonder if you'll still recognize yourself when I'm through. The only similarity between your experiences during the Magarna uprising and my experiences in the garage is that they both began at the same time. But I'll let you be the judge of the similarities and the differences. You've scolded me enough for my comparisons and contrasts. I learned about the prostitution during my first night at the garage, but that was only the beginning of my education. I was a slow learner. During the middle of my first lesson, I got scared and ran away. Jose and Ted both laughed. At the dunce, I thought. But then Ted congratulated me, and I didn't know what to think. Was he a Puritan about everything except stealing? Or did he have hopes that I would reserve my favors for him? I'm not mentioning any other alternatives, because that very night I became convinced that the second alternative explained his congratulations. I went to Tina's room and slipped into the bed next to hers. Suddenly I heard a noise outside. I rushed to the door, which I had left ajar just as Tina had left it. I saw Ted tiptoeing away from it. I thought he had been there since I had entered the room, watching me undress. I went back to bed and started to shake with the same fear I felt earlier that night when I found myself in the back of the chauffeur-driven car next to the fat executive. No matter which way I turned, my heart pounded in my stomach. I couldn't sleep. Part of the reason for that was that I had spent the whole previous afternoon sleeping. My fear of being attacked during the night diminished the following day. Later it vanished completely, but only because it was replaced by another fear. I got up early the next morning, scrupulously dressed in the most masculine clothes I had, and went to the kitchen to pour myself a cup of Tissy's coffee. Ted came in as soon as I'd sat down. Did you have a good night's sleep? You must have, since you're the first one up. I sure am glad you're joining us. He looked like he wanted to embrace me. Grabbing a fork on the table, my lips trembling, I asked, Why did you do that? Why did you look at me? What do you want to do to me? Oh, that, he said, I always do that, but I can see how you'd worry, me being a stranger, just checking things out, you know what I mean, seeing if everything's all right. What a strange explanation, I thought, as if his peeping didn't even concern me. You've got some nerve, I snapped. It's you who've got nerve, he said, responding to my words, but totally missing their meaning. That's what I tried telling you last night. Takes nerve to get scared and run. Wish me and some others here had nerve. What the hell are you talking about? Are you trying to talk yourself out of... That's what I'm talking about, Ted said, pointing at Tizzy, who was making her way towards a coffee pot. Tizzy sat down next to Ted, sipping her coffee, and suddenly looked up at me as if she were seeing me for the first time. Hey, gorgeous, who dolled you up so early in the morning? How did you do last night? Fine, Tizzy, just fine, I lied. Thanks a lot for taking me. Ted got up from his chair as if he'd been stung. He glared down at me. You're not telling her, he asked. Tell her what, Ted, I asked innocently, at last seeing a way to spite him. I really enjoyed it, Tizzy. I got the effect I wanted. 
Ted backed away, seemingly horrified, his face expressing a combination of disappointment and disgust. If he already knew I hadn't gone through with the previous night's escapade, now he also knew it wasn't because I was saving myself for him. Honestly, Tizzy, it was wonderful. I hope you'll take me along again sometime, I continued, watching Ted back out of the kitchen. Now get off it, sis, Tizzy grumbled as soon as Ted was gone. No one thinks it's wonderful and no one enjoys it. You're saying that to rile his ass, ain't you? No, I'm not, Tizzy, I insisted, carried away by my performance. I was afraid at first, but once the fear passed, I got to like it. I said this loudly for Ted's benefit, in case he was still listening, but I was also performing my act for Tizzy's benefit. I didn't want her to think me a snobbish Puritan. I wanted very badly to be part of her world. Don't forget that I was still aching from the series of exclusions I had experienced in the university. I didn't want Tissy to turn against me on the second day of my new life. But I was too ignorant of my new world, and of Tissy, to perform an act that simultaneously estranged me from Ted while it endeared me to Tissy. I used to think your sister weird, Tissy said slowly, sipping her last drop. But you really take the cake, baby. Enjoyed it? God damn. With that, she got up and returned to her room. She, like Ted, seemed disappointed and even disgusted. I sat in the kitchen alone, taking stock of my partial victory. I had succeeded in pushing Ted away from me, but that wasn't my main project. That was a trivial goal born in the previous night's fears. I had failed in my main goal. I had failed to insert myself into my new community. In your letter, you describe Myrna's dreams of moving to the city and becoming part of its life. Not the city of bureaucrats, traffic jams, or cops, but an altogether different city. A city that never existed. A city that contained something she had learned to want. And when she finally reached the real city, she peered behind its curtains and its walls, convinced that her city was there, somewhere, never once giving up her search for whatever it was she had once learned to want. I can easily appropriate your entire vocabulary and apply it to my own search. You've convinced me that my glorification of our activity in the carton plant was nothing more than an exercise in rhetoric. It was only a way of referring to a present gap, a lifelong gap, a way of describing my search for something I had lost, although it had never existed. Something I had learned to want, although I had never experienced it. As I sat in the kitchen behind the garage eleven years ago, I knew nothing of Myrna, and I had failed in my foolhardy attempt to communicate with you. I thought of my past hopes, my dreams of finding a human community, and becoming part of its life. Not the communities of politicians, academics, and journalists. The only thing those communities shared with my dream was the absence of what I sought. When I entered the garage, I had the impression that I was on the verge of finding a trace of what I had sought. This, I thought is it at least something different, something I had never experienced before. And that world did in fact contain elements of what I had sought so desperately elsewhere. That's why I held on despite a long train of shocks and disillusionments. That's why I wanted so badly to be accepted by Tizzy and to be like her. I wanted to be a prostitute and a heroin addict for exactly the same reason that Myrna wanted to be a citizen, an urban worker. In your letter you say, your descent into Sabina's world is a descent into my world. That was what I felt during those first days. That was why I felt ashamed for having run away from Sabina's and Tissy's nightly activity. That was why I tried so awkwardly to lie to Tissy to convince her that I wasn't an alien in her world. Yet instead of winning Tissy's sympathy and friendship, I had only aroused her suspicion. I sat in the kitchen feeling miserable. That kitchen behind the garage was like a snack bar in a bus station. Busy people continually ran in and out while I sat waiting for a bus that never came. I recognized my next visitor as Vic Turham the mechanic I had seen in the garage when I had first arrived with Debbie Matthews. He ate his breakfast in silence, never once taking his eyes off me, never once saying a word. Tina came in next. She asked if I had really known her father, and what was he like. I told her she didn't look the slightest bit like him and immediately regretted making that pointless observation. It certainly didn't encourage Tina to pursue the conversation further. She finished her breakfast in silence and left without a word. Tina was followed by a person I hadn't met yet. You're the sister, he said, ascertaining a fact. The way he said it shamed me further. He might as well have said, you're the nun. I asked who he was. Seth, he answered. I later learned he was a heroin dealer, but he always remained undefined for me, shadowy and hostile. I didn't like him any better than he seemed to like me. After Seth left, there was a lull. It was noon before Sabina and Jose joined me in the kitchen. I assumed they had gotten up together and came from the same room. I soon learned I was mistaken. Jose greeted me so jovially that he jarred me out of my pensive mood. Is Ron's girl brooding? It's too early in the day for that. Then he turned to Sabina and added, referring indirectly to my previous night's embarrassment, we ought to spend some time showing the sister the sunny side of life, right, Sabina? Letting her brood when she's just arrived, that's not right, Sabina. That's not showing proper respects to our founder. 
I thought I heard a note of hostility. My impression was confirmed as soon as Sabina spoke. Take her on a tour, Jose, she said. You're the son of the underworld. Light everything up for her. I won't cloud her vision. I'm leaving. I reached across the table for Sabina's hand and pleaded, I have to talk to you, Sabina, a long talk. Sabina pulled her hand away as if mine were diseased. I was amazed and hurt. She finished sipping her coffee and said curtly, Sure, Sophia, but I've got to run now. I have a free hour between three and four this afternoon. She got up and left like a businessman with important appointments. Your sister is a very busy woman, Jose said, explaining the obvious. Then he added with the same hostility I noticed before, She don't have time to brood. Suddenly he reached for my hand, held it in his, and said laughing, But we're not all like that. Come on, I'll show you around. Jose gave me a complete tour of the accommodations behind the garage. I was struck by how clean and well-arranged everything was, and how expensive. When I'd first seen the building from the outside, it looked run down. The garage through which I'd entered had seemed dirtier and messier than most garages I'd seen. But when Jose escorted me through the hall from one room to the next, I realized for the first time that the garage was literally a front, a facade. I'd been impressed by the nightclub to which Tissy had taken me, but I'd been too preoccupied by my fears to look around the house. The walls and ceiling were all paneled, and at frequent intervals, paintings were set into the wall panels, as were most of the cupboards. The floors were all covered by heavy rugs. The basement contained a laundry room, a marvelously equipped and very clean workshop, and a recreation room, which Jose had said hadn't ever been completed because no one used it. He told me the second floor consisted of lofts and an experiment room, and that if I wanted to see them, I'd have to go up with their users, Ted, Sabina, and Tina. My head was swimming. I wasn't able to take it all in. What struck me almost as much as the luxury was the fact that each person slept in a separate room, although there were twin beds or a double bed in every bedroom. I asked Jose awkwardly, aren't there any couples? Couples, he asked, visibly annoyed. Sure there are couples, lots of them. There's hardly anything else. Without even trying to interpret his answer, I asked, you and Sabina? Not on your life, he said angrily. You never got to know your sister, did you? This is her room. Mine's over there. We were never a couple and never will be. Any more questions? I'm sorry, I said, not knowing just what I was sorry about. Jose's anger vanished and he smiled. Nothing to be sorry about. I'm the one that's sorry. I wanted to show you the work in the garage next. But I was too confused and too tired to continue the tour. How about tomorrow, I asked. I had a terrible night last night. I liked Jose. I wanted to go on and tell him about my fears about Ted, but I held myself back. Sure, he said. I hope you don't have any more terrible nights. I fell on my bed in Tina's room as soon as I reached it. I woke up like the previous night at midnight. Tina was sound asleep. I had missed my afternoon appointment with Sabina. I had also missed all my meals. I crept to the kitchen and literally looted the refrigerator. When I was finally satisfied, I sat down and waited for Tissy, but realized she must have gone to work on time. When I heard the heavy garage door closing, I turned out the kitchen light, rushed back to Tina's room, left the door ajar, and slipped back to bed with my clothes still on. I listened to Ted and Jose walk to their rooms. After a long silence, I heard someone tiptoeing towards my room. I kept my eyes glued to the door and saw Ted creep through the opening. For an instant, he just stood there and stared. Then he backed out of the room. I started shaking again. I hadn't only failed to communicate with Tizzy, I had also failed to communicate anything to Ted. I lay awake all night. When Tina got up in the morning, I pretended to be asleep and fell asleep until noon. When I reached the kitchen, I found Sabina pouring Tizzy a cup of coffee. Tissy didn't even notice me. Sabina, I said. I know, Sabina said. Let's go to my room. As soon as we reached her room, she said, Wait for me just a minute, would you? I have to make some phone calls. Just like a businessman. Anger and resentment filled my every pore as I paced back and forth like a caged animal. I was determined to have it all out with Sabina. I pounced as soon as she returned. Sabina, why did you pull your hand away from me as if I were a leper? What am I to you? I went on pacing. Sabina closed her door and then just stood and stared at me. Suddenly she burst out laughing. I've never seen you like this, Sophia. You're marvelous. Running around in a circle, filled with righteous fury, frustrated out of your wits. You look just like a circus clown. Sabina threw her arms around me and pressed me tightly. I collapsed in her arms. My anger melted away. I forgot what I had resented. I felt at home. I love your house, Sabina, I whispered. Sabina said, I'm glad you do. Then she kissed me, on my lips. I was surprised, but also pleased because I knew then that I wasn't an intrusive stranger to Sabina. She asked, do you mind? You're the only friend I wanted to turn to in the entire world, I whispered. Sabina stiffened as she let me go. So much for the preliminary, she said, making herself comfortable on her bed. 
Let's talk about anything and everything, as long as you want. No time limits, no secrets. Sabina, I'm frightened, I whispered, sitting down next to her. You, a natural love, frightened, she asked in a mocking tone. Is someone after you? I knew she meant someone outside, but I answered, yes, it's Ted. Oh, get off it, Sophia, she shouted, angrily hurling a pillow across the room. She seemed disappointed, even disgusted, as Tissy and Ted had seemed the previous morning when I announced I enjoyed my first experience as a prostitute. Are you serious, she continued? We haven't been together for years. We've both lived whole lives since we last talked to each other, and all you tell me is that Ted is after you? Are you sure you don't mean Seth? I was in a panic. I wanted to apologize. I didn't want Sabina to turn against me. I shook my head. I could understand your being afraid of Seth, she said. He might shoot you or stab you, or even Vic, but not Ted. What happened to you, Sophia? What have you become? I was deathly afraid Sabina was going to add, Coward, you're just like your mother. I felt the tears rushing towards my eyes. But for once in my life, I caught myself before breaking down crying. I bit my lip, stiffened up, and looked right into Sabina's eyes. Why did you pull your hand away yesterday? I'm schizoid, she said. What are you? I'm only joking, I said, trying hard to smile. I was just trying to devise an original way to start. I'll try again, just to get started. Let's turn to Ted. Who is Ted? What is he? Holy, wise, and fair is he. The heaven such grace did lend him that he might admired be, Sabina mocked, unconvinced by my act, but not determined to look under my veil. You'd know who he was if you'd listen, and you'd know what he was if you'd heard and been moved. Please don't be cryptic, I begged. An unused memory is like a pair of eyes that have never been opened, Sabina said. I've always wanted to have memory training from you, Sabina. Is this to be my first lesson? I asked. There's the Sophia I remember, Sabina retorted. Sarcasmos. It means to cut or bite another's flesh. Ron was trying to tell you all about Ted, but you bit right through him with your... Really? I remembered. Sabina and Ron had visited me five years earlier, when Ron was released from reform school. Ron had tried to tell me about all the people he'd met, but I'd shut him out with my stupid, Really? That had been the last time I'd seen Ron. Thanks for the memory lesson, I said, confirming her characterization of me. Ted is Ron's reform school philosopher. Not philosopher, Sabina corrected. Scientist, engineer, artist, acrobat, one of the best minds of our time. He can pick the lock of any brand new car and drive away with it in less than a minute, I added. If I'd remembered last night, I would have known it wouldn't do me any good to lock my door. But to compensate for that, I could at least have consoled myself with the thought that he was Ron's friend and one of the best minds of our time. Is he at least nice? Sabina kicked me and laughed, saying, But you haven't changed at all. You're just like my mother, I interrupted. Sabina stopped laughing. I wasn't going to say that again, Sophia. It's too mean. Besides, if you ever compare me to my so-called father, I'll kill you. In the flesh or just with words, the way I bite, I asked. Don't worry, I don't know enough about either of you to hazard such a comparison. And I'd ask you about Ted. Is he nice, she repeated. You'd probably know that now if you'd curbed your sarcasm five years ago. No, that's not true, since then you probably wouldn't have gotten along with Ron and consequently wouldn't have met Ted then either. Ron admired your sarcasm. Did he like me for my sarcasm, I asked? Not altogether, Sabina answered. He only liked your sarcasm when it was aimed at other people. How badly he wanted you along when they stole Tom Matthews' brand new car. Your sarcastic comments would have put the crowning touch on that event. Ron missed your comments. The event was incomplete without them. He never got over your absence. He had staged it all for you and you never saw it. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. You do and you don't, Sabina said cryptically. It was your sarcasm that was missed, yet it was that very same sarcasm that kept you away. Did Ron like you for your sarcasm? Do I? I do like you, Sophia. And you've always been sarcastic. Close enough? I'm only guessing. I never asked Ron precisely that question. Is Ted nice? You'd know if you'd watch Ted break into Matthew's car and if you'd finish Matthew's off with your biting comment. Ron thought he was nice. Ted was the first person he looked up when he left you after your, really? Is Ted really everything Ron thought he was? I asked, immediately regretting the presence of that silly word since Sabina caught it right away. Is he really? She mocked with a sarcasm far superior to mine. Believe me, Sophia, everything. Engineer, he'll slip into your room in a flash without a key. Scientist. Before you shout for help, he'll turn your flesh to liquid and carry you off in a vial. Artist, he'll pour you out in his loft as a marble statue, life-size and perfect likeness. Acrobat, sarcasmo's my ass, Sabina, I interrupted. You love my sarcasm. Do you want to know why? Don't you think I know? Did you think we were considered sisters because we looked alike? We both burst out laughing. Sabina and I became friends for the first time in our lives. 
If Ted is everything Ron thought he was, why don't you like him, I asked. I don't remember your being that observant, Sabina said. In fact, I don't like him, though this is the first time I've been aware of my dislike. It's not because of anything he is, did, or said, but because I know he despises me. It's normal to dislike someone who despises you, isn't it? Ask him sometime when you're reconciled with him. Tell him you're afraid of me. He won't laugh at you or call you a coward. He'll drown you with friendship and shower you with a barrel full of sympathy. He might even ask you to kill me. I reached instinctively for her hand and asked, Sabina, why? Sabina raised my hand to her throat and asked, would you do it? Of course, like this, I said, pressing her neck lightly and kissing her cheek. Sabina smiled. It was precisely at this moment that Tissy burst into the room. I thought such coincidences took place only in novels. There we were, sitting next to each other on Sabina's bed, necking, my lips on Sabina's cheek, a blissful smile across Sabina's face. Tissy stood in the doorway and stared at us, absolutely stupefied, while Sabina lowered my hand from her neck. Tissy completed the scene by making it clear she had understood everything perfectly. I'm awfully sorry, she said, backing away with the same stupefied stare. I thought you were alone, Sabina. I didn't know. And that's that, I shouted as soon as Tissy was gone. I jumped off the bed laughing. I wouldn't even try explaining. She'd only think we were liars besides. I stopped laughing when it occurred to me that Tissy already thought me a liar besides. It had done me no good at all to insist that I had enjoyed having sex with a man for money. If Tissy also remembered how profusely I'd thank her for taking me to the bar, she'd think me not only a lesbian and a liar, but a hypocrite to boot. I had obviously lost Tissy, but I wasn't depressed. I had won Sabina. Does it bother you, I asked? Me, Sabina asked. Tissy can think whatever she wants. Sabina didn't laugh. She looked sad. I put the incident out of my mind. I didn't, in fact, understand its full meaning until much later. I sat back down and returned to the point we'd reached before we were interrupted. Why in the world would Ted want to kill you? I think that's awful. Sabina stared blankly at the door for a few seconds and then answered in a monotone, as if my question bored her. I didn't say he wanted to kill me. He's incapable of wanting that. He's one of the few people I've met who knew the difference between things and people and never confused the two. He can do anything that's ever been done with a tool, but he'll never touch a weapon, and he'll never confuse the two. He doesn't step on a worm if he sees it in time, and he looks sadly at a dead fly. You're afraid of him? Sophia, believe me, the world will end before Ted attacks you. I can't imagine his wanting to kill you or me. Then why would he ask me to kill you, I asked, totally bewildered, although I was also relieved to learn that my pursuer wouldn't hurt a worm. I said he might, Sabina continued, but I know he never would. It's what I do in his shoes. All I know is for a fact he fears me and despises me. He's odd. We're all odd, but each in a different way. Ted's oddity is that he's gone through life making his own decisions, but he's convinced that everyone else is manipulated. If you want a more theoretical explanation, in his practice he's a perfect democrat, while in his political philosophy he's an absolute elitist. But he's not a philosopher. He doesn't think. He just acts and feels. He acts as if I were the one responsible for everything that happens here, and he despises me for it. Responsible for what kinds of things, I asked, becoming increasingly bewildered. Everything, she repeated. For Tissy, for Vic and Sav, for what Jose or Tina might do, for everything. It's a long story and I'm not a mind reader. I'm just guessing. He's of a piece, all right. Perfectly consistent. 100% right. And he knows it. His contempt for me is completely justified. Would you mind explaining, I begged? I'm confused. I don't guarantee to clarify anything, Sabina said. The garage was Ted and Ron's idea. They dreamed of buying it when they were in reform school. Ted had worked for the former owner. Stealing cars and selling heroin, I asked. Just the cars, Sabina continued. The heroin came later. The former owner became increasingly careless, spent half his time in jail, and let the place get all run down. Ted rented it as soon as he was released, and we bought it soon after Ron was released. The original group was to include Ted and Tizzy, you and Ron, and Jose. Me? What about you? I'll get to that. Tizzy was to be included because she'd been Ted's girlfriend since they were kids. He thinks I'm responsible for what she chose to do with herself, but he's wrong. He didn't know Tissy when they were kids together. That's what makes him nice, I suppose. I call it dense. Ted and Ron might as well have been twins in that respect. You were to be included because you were Ron's girl. Ron cried Sophie every time there was a knock on the door. And of course Jose was included because he was Ron's best friend. But that didn't work out. Ron finally convinced himself that you weren't coming and went off to get himself killed. And Jose didn't like the idea of moving in on Ted and Tizzy. He thought he and Ted would kill each other over Tizzy. Tizzy was terribly pretty, but Jose didn't know her then. So Jose suggested a different arrangement. He recommended his and Ron's friend Seth for this money, 
and Ron's friend Sabina for her brains. Ted was absolutely opposed to that suggestion, but Tizzy was carried away by it. I forgot to tell you another one of Ted's traits. He's a perpetual loser. This follows from his other traits. Seth moved in and brought Vic. I came with Jose and Ted's original project started to collapse. Seth started dealing heroin from the garage. Then Tizzy got hooked on it. Ted raised a big fuss and succeeded in getting Seth to move out of the house. But things didn't improve for him. Jose and I and Seth went in on the bar together and soon Tizzy and I were working there. And he blames you for all that, I asked? Why did he want to ex exclude you from the original group before any of those things happened? I already gave you part of the answer, she said obscurely. Ted draws a perfectly clear line between people and things. The heaven such grace did lend him that he might admire be. And I do admire him for it, whether his ability comes from his grace, instinct, or personal insight. Holy, wise, and fair is he, applying to his standard impartially to all situations. Depriving the rich of their objects and transforming those objects with a view to increasing the well-being of the underlying population is an ambiguously human and possibly revolutionary project. Selling one's body, ruining one's own or another's health cannot be means to reaching the same goal because our humanity would be maimed when we reached it, and our humanity is our goal. Ted's logic is impeccable, but of course he never formulates it as logic. He never expresses his philosophy. He acts it out. And that's why the trouble started. He disliked me the very first time we met, soon after Ron tried to tell you about Ted in the garage. Ron told Ted about his half-brother, Jose, and then started talking about this rich friend of his, Seth. A dope dealer, Ted asked. Ron dropped the subject right away, but I didn't. At the time, Ron and I thought that everything a person was jailed for was a revolutionary act. But I learned something from Ted that night. I drew answers from him like a dentist pulling his teeth out. I made sentences out of his single words and logical propositions out of his grimaces and groans. Before the night ended, I hadn't only drawn his entire philosophy out of him, but had become completely convinced by it. Ron fell asleep. Ted's philosophy isn't all that difficult. It all hinges on Ted's distinction between people and things, and his corollary distinction between weapons and tools. Once you get hold of the axiom, everything else follows. And he exhibits his axiom on his face and in every gesture. He grins when a tool is in question and groans when it's a weapon. But Ted didn't appreciate what I did for him. He squirmed every time I put his attitudes into words. He became increasingly frightened of me, as if I were depriving him of something precious, as if I were undressing him stitch by stitch, as if I were reaching inside him and pulling his guts out for all to see. He hated me from that day on, and he never forgave me. That's why he hoped you'd join Ron. Ted is everything but a philosopher. He fears philosophy. He's suspicious of logic, even of words. He can express himself in metal, wood, marble, canvas, everything but words. To him, philosophy isn't a tool but a weapon. Its only purpose is to manipulate people. And he's convinced it's the weapon with which I've manipulated every person here except himself and Tina. And he's not sure about Tina. Sabina suddenly jumped off the bed like an energetic cat, pulled me up as well, and shouted, Hey, it's dark already. Why are we spending the day cooped up in here like prisoners? Let me take you on a tour. Jose took me on a tour of the house yesterday, I told her. Let's go to the bar then, she suggested. Tissy took me there on my first night here, I admitted, remembering afterwards that Tissy had begged me never to tell Sabina. Tissy took you, Sabina exclaimed. Clenching her fist, she added, why the little hypocrite. I asked her to take me, I added, trying to protect Tissy, and surprised by Sabina's outburst. Sensing my surprise, she calmed down and said, as if by way of explanation, I thought I was going to have that honor. What's left for a hostess if she can't show off? I asked Tissy to take me because you told her you'd never take me there, I said, still protecting Tissy. Not to work there, Sophia, she said. That's for you to choose or not choose. We haven't eaten all day. I'm starving and the food there is as tasty as the girls are beautiful. I laughed thinking she was referring to herself and Tissy, and I started heading towards my room. Hey, where are you going, she shouted, grabbing my arm. To change my clothes, I said, pointing to my blue jeans and work shirt. You look perfect as you are, she said. But I wore these clothes all night, I protested. You also smell perfect, she insisted, pulling me out of the house. We walked to the bar, continuing our conversation every step of the way. I told her I spotted a contradiction between her praise for Ted's philosophy and her activity in the bar. Sabina admitted the contradiction, but we reached the bar before she had time to deal with it. Sabina did something strange as soon as we entered. She put her arm through mine and escorted me along the stools of the bar right past Tissy. Evening, Tissy, she said nonchalantly, but with a mean grin on her face. I said hi, Tissy, and tried to smile, but I felt intensely embarrassed. I knew I was right in the middle of something I couldn't understand. 
Sabina exchanged greetings with some of the other girls, and I noted they were indeed pretty, and all very tastefully dressed. I was surprised. My notions of how prostitutes looked and dressed had come from newspapers and novels. When I saw them in the flesh, I felt like a homely clod among them, Sabina's country sister, maybe even her aunt. As we walked across the floor toward a table, a frighteningly large man grabbed Sabina's arm and said, Hey, Sabina, baby, thought you weren't coming tonight. Sabina jerked herself out of his grasp so quickly that I thought she'd sent an electric shock through him as she hissed at him through her teeth. Don't lay your hands on me, bozo. I'm busy tonight. Gee, Sabina, how's it got to know that? The huge man asked, backing away from us. As soon as we reached a table in the dark corner of the enormous room, Sabina asked me, Are you shocked? Before I could answer, a waiter came, greeted Sabina, and bowed to me. The work, Sabina told him. I've got a very special guest tonight. Shocked, I asked. I was confused, flattered, distressed, pleased. I felt dense, ignorant, and lost, but I wasn't shocked. Why should I be shocked? You've told me what you do, and I've seen this place already. You're being evasive, she said. Do you disapprove? Do you disapprove of my being sarcastic, I asked. The waiter brought us the best drink I'd ever tasted, and I started sipping. Good answer, she said, but then pushed on. What were you saying about the contradiction between Ted's philosophy and my practice? She's really all brain, I thought. But I changed my mind immediately when I remembered several of the day's events that led to a very different conclusion. I tried to concentrate my thoughts, or rather to find out what they were. The band was playing a familiar tune, and I listened and started to hum. I couldn't keep up with Sabina. Finally, I admitted, I'm completely lost. I don't understand you, Sabina. I don't understand Ted, although I'm less afraid of him now, and I don't see how I fit into it all. Sabina reached for my hand and said, looking straight into my eyes, There's nothing to understand, Sophia and nothing to fit into. It's your life to do with as you will. There's no structure. Nothing is banned. Everything is allowed. No holds are barred. What's everything, I asked hesitantly. Letting go of my hand, she said, my life, my desires, my capacities. Those are my axioms. And this, I asked, my glance sweeping across the bar, the sex-crazed men, the prostitutes. A person freely creates her own life, but in circumstances not of her own choosing, she answered. I've heard that before, but I don't see how it applies, I said. All this, as you call it, is part of the circumstances not of my own choosing, she answered. Just then the waiter arrived with the works. I had never in my life eaten so much delicious food. The meal was indeed as tasty as the place was lush. We continued our conversation all through the meal, and I grew increasingly giddy from the wine. That sounds terribly cynical, I said with my mouth full. It is, Sabina admitted, but I'm not being cynical. The cynicism is part of the world I was born into, the world I'm trying to get out of. I'm not sure I understand, I said, and then probed further. The fullest development of my life, my projects, my capacities, desires, she added. Yes, all of it, I granted. I think I understand that, but I... She interrupted again. With which organ do you understand that? I was stunned. Organ? What do you mean? I know some people who understand that, but only in their sexual organ. We both know people who understand it only in their political organ, people who understand everything you'd want to know about life, capacities, and desires, who accepted themselves as slaves, who've never lived in their lives, who stunted all their capacities, who've annihilated their desires. Her anger grew as she spoke. And their collective name is Louisa Natchelow, I ventured. I didn't name any names, she shouted. Anyway, she's not the only one. You must have met dozens, if not hundreds of them, during your years in the university. Life, desires, capacities... They've reduced them all to words, words which they carry around in their political organs. And they're the ones who impose life on everyone else. They don't know what life is because they've never lived, and they're intent on generalizing their own condition. For the sake of the word, for the primacy of the political organ. What about the means, Sabina? The tools, I asked. I was getting dizzy from the wine, and I had a hard time formulating my question. Earlier you said you could get maimed by the tools you used, or was it weapons? We come maimed, Sabina exclaimed. The question is whether or not we're able to heal, not abstractly, but here and now. Look around you. Look closely at the waiters, the band members, the prostitutes. None of them are people born with golden spoons in their mouths. They're down and outs, every last one of them. They're the underclass. All of them came here off the streets or out of jail. They were already dope pushers, prostitutes, hustlers, and pimps. That's part of the circumstances they didn't choose. They came maimed, and they're starting to heal. In what way, I asked. Did you look at that ape who grabbed me earlier, she asked. He's part of the apparatus that does the maiming. He's one of the biggest crooks in this city. He's an official in one of the international corporations. 
When he snaps his fingers, people all over the world respond like caged rats responding to experimenter stimulus. See the girl he's with at the bar? She used to be lower than the lowest rat in his cages. She was the slave of every two-bit pimp on her street, and if she wound up in the garbage dump, no one would have missed her. And look at her now. She's on her ninth or tenth drink and probably on her fifth dessert, and he's ordering another round. The price of food and drinks here is over a hundred times the cost. And you know what? She'll go to the john after a while, slip out the back, and go home. Eventually, he'll turn to someone else and start all over again. He's Mr. International. But here it's we who snap our fingers and he who jumps. One of us always goes in the end, but first we soak him to the limit. And everything we get out of him stays right here. It's all ours. This is anti-imperialism in practice, Sophia. This is class war. And we're winning. We all have expensive hobbies now. And some of us have more than hobbies. All the way from sex to crafts, painting and playing with the sciences. I'll show you sometime. We're all expanding, discovering ourselves. We're starting to live and we want to live more. If we're ever going to destroy what maims us, it'll be because we've started to live. Those who love life will be the ones who'll push the fucker into the sea. Look toward the door. See that weasel who just came in? He's the local police chief. Look at him putting his hand on that girl's ass. Watch what happens now. I saw the girl turn around and sock the police chief, who went reeling backwards till he tripped over the stool and fell. Outside, he does that to the likes of us whenever he pleases, Sabina said. Watch him get up and go back to her. The funniest thing is that she'll probably go out with him. It's getting late. Is that demeaning? I don't know, I mumbled. My head was swimming and I was getting sick. Is that maiming? Maybe it is, she continued. I know it is, but we didn't create the means. We found them, and we're learning to use them. The chief's making up to her now. She'll decide to go with him. The room was moving up and down like a ship. I felt worse every minute, but Sabina didn't notice. She kept on talking. She'll sell him sex for money. You'll notice a contradiction, and you're right. Sex is also her hobby. Hobby is a lousy word. It's her life. You know what she does with her money? She had her apartment redone. Wall-to-wall -wall mattresses. All down. In every room except the bathroom and kitchen. She fills her apartment with everyone she can find between the age of 6 and 60. Every conceivable shape, size, and age. And then she lives. She satisfies every desire, every whim. She engages in every conceivable and inconceivable perversion, if you like that word. I don't. I held onto the table to keep myself from falling. I heard her words, but all I saw was a blur. My insides felt like bubbling lava. But she pays some of them, Sabina continued. That's a contradiction, a terrible contradiction. She still hasn't healed. She's still revenging herself for what she was forced to undergo. She still can't tell people from things, nor distinguish her life from the means that make it possible. She hasn't learned to draw Ted's fine line. Ted won't ever be caught in such a contradiction. He'll never make that mistake. He works in the garage. That's the circumstances, the means. But he plays in the loft and in the basement workshop. That's his goal, his life. She confuses the two. She hasn't learned to make Ted's distinctions and maybe never will. We all come maimed. But don't think Ted doesn't. She's healthier than Ted in at least one respect. She knows people. He only knows things. She knows the boundlessness of desires. He only knows the possibilities of things. She knows love in every conceivable form and sex in every imaginable combination, position, or pattern. He only knows love and sex in the forms practiced by the maimed, by those with stunted imaginations and dead desires. He can imagine things in all combinations, positions, and patterns. He knows people aren't things, and he's profoundly right. He's wise, even holy, but he doesn't know people. He also came maimed. I must have passed out. The next thing I remember is being carried through the garage to Tina's room. Jose carried my feet, and Ted's arms were under my back. I must have fallen asleep right away. I heard someone tiptoeing toward my door. I watched Ted slip through the opening and walk right up to my bed. He stood staring down at me. Suddenly he pulled a blanket off me. I saw that he held a wrench in one hand and a screwdriver in the other. I jumped out of bed terrified and found myself lying on the floor next to my bed. It was a nightmare, but I couldn't stop my trembling. The sun was already up, but Tina was still sound asleep. I was panicky. I crept toward Sabina's room, shook her hysterically, and whimpered, Help me, Sabina. Sabina swung her arm and hit my side so powerfully that I fell to the floor. Looking right at me, seemingly wide awake, she hissed through her teeth, Don't touch me. She spoke to me in the same tone with which she'd spoke to the corporation executive who'd grabbed her arm. Sabina, I cried with disbelief. It's me, Sophia, your friend, your sister. Get out of my room, Louisa, she hissed viciously. You're not my sister. I gathered myself up off the floor and backed away from her, horrified. Snatches of the previous night's conversation flashed through my mind, particularly her statements, 
I'm schizoid, what are you? And he only knows love and sex in the forms practiced by the maimed. You'd like nothing better than for Ted to rape me, I cried hysterically. You'd say he was healed. For his sake and for yours, she hissed. I slammed her door and ran back to my bed. In a few minutes, I stopped trembling. I was wide awake and felt dumber than a baboon. I realized that I had run to Sabina's room under the spell of my nightmare. That was the only time in my life that I acted out the remainder of a dream after waking. I felt ashamed of myself. I was afraid to face Sabina. I lay in my bed feeling intensely embarrassed long after Tina got dressed and left the room. I had a splitting headache. I reached the kitchen around noon, a couple minutes before Sabina. She set me at ease immediately. I had the strangest dream. Or did you actually come in my room last night and... She started to ask. You dreamed it, Sabina, I insisted. I just got up. That's a relief, she said. It was awful. What was it about, I asked, frowning. Do you really want to hear about it, she asked. I'd rather not, I said, but I would like to ask you one question. Want me to call off my day's project, she asked, smiling and friendly, sisterly again, but surely unconvinced that last night's visit had been a dream. No, please, not even one. It's only a bitty question, I insisted, trying hard to smile. What's my name? Of course she knew then that I'd lied. How sad she suddenly looked, but she's so crazy and such a ham that I couldn't possibly nurse my resentment against her. She walked around the table, kneeled to me, and placed her contrite head in my lap. Lifting her head, I begged, please look at me, Sabina, and tell me who I am, and please don't kneel. Pray, do not mock me, she quoted. I am a very foolish, fond young maid, a score and upward, not an hour more nor less, and to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you. You are a spirit, I know. Yet I feel this pinprick. Oh, do not laugh at me, for as I am a woman, I think this lady to be my sister Sophia. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. You have some cause. No cause, I whispered, smiling through my tears. Now get up, you have a busy day. Ruthless and contrite, icy and warm, monarch, enemy, and sister. I couldn't hold on to my resentment against any of the four or ten or a hundred Sabinas, nor could I make her activities the model for mine probably because I, too, came maimed. You describe your trip to Sabina's garage as a descent to the underworld, you said, and that's exactly what it was, and remained, no matter how familiar it might seem to you. I remained a disoriented tourist, a visit from another world. It didn't even occur to me to ask Sabina to take me along on her day's business rounds. Did she go out to look for more beautiful girls for the bar? Was it her turn with the international executive? Or was she going to her friend's wall-to-wall -wall down mattress to satisfy every desire, every whim, every conceivable and inconceivable perversion? I admit I was curious, but I wasn't curious enough to go along, or even to ask, and Sabina didn't make the slightest effort to influence my choice. She let me know that I could have her friendship if I wanted it, and whenever I wanted it, but that was all. I was my own person, and she didn't impose her herself. Ted wasn't the only person in the house who was perfectly consistent. Sabina wouldn't have interfered if I'd spent every day in bed, started taking heroin, or floated down the river. She'd have stopped me from setting fire to myself only if she'd thought the flame would burn the house. I'm exaggerating. It became perfectly clear to me she wouldn't raise a finger to keep Ted away from my bed until he actually injured me. Still, there was no structure, Sabina had told me. How true this was. Everything was allowed. No holds were barred. I could have joined anyone or taken up with anyone at any time of day or night. Or I could have indulged some fancy of my own. If it had been expensive, Sabina would have paid for it. If I'd wanted to pay for it myself, she would have showed me how. There were no limits to what I could choose, but I couldn't choose. I realized that I'd never made a real decision before. I'm sorry if the sequel disappoints you. I didn't make one then either, and I haven't made one since. I don't know how. I came maimed. Unable to lean on Sabina, I tried to lean on Tissy, though not for long. She obviously wasn't as well disposed towards me as she had been on the first day. She sat across from me, ate a meager lunch drowned by an enormous quantity of coffee, and made small talk. When I asked if she'd ever take me to the bar again, she became indignant and announced, You don't look like Sabina's sister. I guess that Tissy wasn't only ascertaining the fact that Sabina and I didn't look alike, there being no reason why we should. Since she already knew me to be a liar, she was letting me know she'd had no trouble at all figuring out who and what I really was. I was obviously Sabina's man parading as her sister. I couldn't have explained anything. I'd advise Sabina not even to try. Tissy spoke to me again slightly later. She was suddenly a lot friendlier. If you'd ever like to have a shot, she said, just let me know. Seth would be glad to give you as many as you need. Need was the word I latched onto. As many as I need. So much for leaning on Tissy, I thought. 
How helpful. She was certainly willing enough to help me with my choices. She certainly wasn't above imposing herself on another. I should really have thanked her. Instead, I said, no, thank you. Tried to very hard to reciprocate her earlier hostility. I apparently succeeded. She kept her distance for several weeks, but I hadn't gotten a step closer to making a decision, to choosing the shape of myself in the world. I really should explain my hostile no thank you, since nowadays it might be attributed to prudishness. Radicals who are Tina's age today might think me maimed in that respect as well. That explanation would be false because my generation of radicals, there were pitifully few in that generation, explicitly ranged narcotics among the weapons of the oppressor. The anti-utopia I grew up with was a brave new world of nodding imbeciles kept in line by tranquilizers and kept happy and pacified by narcotics. I simply can't stomach those of Tina's peers who today consider the imbecilic nod of an addict the supreme revolutionary act. Not that Tina shares that idiocy. In this respect, as in many others, she might as well belong to Sabina's and my generation. My no thank you was an expression not of prudishness, but of genuine hostility. My hostility wasn't personal. It wasn't aimed at Tissy, but only against the offered drug. I made no effort to impose myself on Tissy, to convert her to my attitude. I did try to, to avoid Vic, and particularly Seth, but I didn't once confront them about the dope dealing. The heroin was largely responsible for my final departure from the garage, but it wasn't I who started the scene about it. I only stayed away from it and responded with hostility to all offers. By rejecting the heroin, I antagonized Tissy and, by implication, Seth and Vic. Since I didn't know how to lean on myself and didn't want to learn, I was left with the garage crew, Ted, Jose, and Tina, and I wasn't about to lean on Ted. I turned to Jose first, but that day wasn't really my lucky day. I went to the garage and paced, waiting for him to return from an errand. Ted and Tina were so busily at work they didn't even notice me. Vic just stood there like a fixture. But the day I arrived, I thought, Vic, another mechanic. But he did nothing at all. He was like an aged cat that looks on but never moves. You might think he was the commissar assigned to watch the others work. I paid more attention to Vic's presence than I did to anything Tina or Ted were doing. When Jose finally came back, I went up to him and put my foot straight into my mouth. I'd like to accept your offer, I said. I was, of course, referring to his offer to show me the work in the garage. Jose grabbed my wrist and literally dragged me out into the street. Let me get just one thing clear, he shouted when we were outside of anyone's hearing. Ron's best friend never made Ron's girl any kind of offer. Oh no, what have I done now, I thought. But you said yesterday, I started. You don't understand, he shouted. I never made you an offer. I'm sorry, I said, trying to look sorry but wanting to laugh. I didn't mean that kind of offer. You said me you'd show me. He cut me off again. I've got to explain something to you, he said insistently. I used to dream about you long before I met you. I thought about that big guy wanting a bride badly enough to go and kill himself because of her. I thought that's not something you'd find every day. I thought I'd really like to meet up with her. I thought, wow, that must really be some piece of ass. I'm sorry, I don't mean that. I mean some dame. He told me you were sensitive about the names we give to, uh, broads, chicks, you know. Try women, I suggested. That's what it says on shit houses. Is that better? He asked. You're a little bit like him, I said. I liked him. A lot. I never kill myself over a, br a girl, a woman, he said. Why do you keep repeating that? I asked. I had no idea what any of it meant, but I didn't care. He did remind me of Ron. Because that's what made me think I wouldn't want to meet her. That's when I remembered she left him when he needed her most. She left him when he was just about ready to take off and do some big things on his own, with her and for her. And that's when I thought that a girl who'd done that to him wasn't for me. And then, almost four years later, she comes walking right into the garage as if nothing had ever happened. And she lets me take her on a tour of the house. Something funny must have happened inside me. I must have gone back to my first thoughts. I must have thought, wow, she really is some woman. And then it must be when those thoughts were in my head that something I said might have sounded like an offer. But you've got to understand that whatever I said, I didn't mean it. Because those first thoughts aren't the thoughts I have now. You'd better understand that I'm not about to make Ron's girl any kind of offer. I understand. I lied. I didn't understand anything. What can I do to make up for what you blame me for? Just stay out of my sight, he answered. Because you really are some piece of ass, I finished his sentence with the words he'd have preferred and added coquettishly, and you'd better understand that Ron's girl isn't going to accept any kind of offer. I ran back through the garage to the now empty kitchen. I wasn't hungry and ate from habit. I then took a long walk along streets where there were lots of people. I thought that with more of the same luck, I might successfully antagonize a complete stranger. But I didn't meet anyone and turned in before Tina did. 
I had a long, marvelously restful sleep without interruptions, fears, or nightmares. It was only on the following day that my active life in the garage began. Tina was already gone when I woke up. I re-examined my situation as I sipped my breakfast coffee. I had knocked down every one of my potential props except one, seven-year-old Tina, and rather than face up to Sabina's challenge, I went to the garage looking for Tina. I squatted next to her and silently watched her work. She seemed annoyed by my presence. Would you mind showing me how you do things here, I asked, begging. Ted'll show you. He's much better at it than I am. He showed everyone, she said innocently. I don't want Ted to show me, I insisted. I want you to show me. Tina stopped what she was doing, turned to me, and looked into my eyes as if she were searching for something. Suddenly she said, You're my mother, aren't you? I almost fell over backwards. Why in the world do you say that? You were Ron's girl, weren't you? Yes, I was for a time, I admitted, but I swear I'm not your mother. Why did you leave us, she asked. Oh no, I thought, there goes my last prop. Tina, I swear I never left you, I whispered insistently, and I hoped convincingly. Tina went back to her work, and I went on squatting next to her. Fortunately for me, Tina was more compassionate than her older but not wiser housemates. She worked in silence for a while. Suddenly she said, here, hold this, and my apprenticeship began. The seven-year-old teacher and her 23-year-old student became inseparable. I went to bed when she did and got up when she did. We ate our meals together and spent most of the day working together. I became a crack auto mechanic, an amateur carpenter, and something less than an amateur, namely a lousy welder, wood turner, and machinist. Tina knew what to do with every tool in the garage, and she could operate every machine in the downstairs workshop. Let no one tell me about the virtues of specialization, the lifelong training required by each trade or the helplessness of children. Tina taught me infinitely more than the uses of the tools or the operations possible on each machine. She taught me what human beings might be if... But there was one thing she didn't show me, the lofts. She assured me I could have a loft of my own if I decided to paint or sculpt, and then I could visit the other painters and sculptors, namely Ted and Tina, to study their materials and techniques. I told Tina I preferred to express myself with a full pen and an empty piece of paper. Admission to the lofts and to Sabina's lab was restricted to the artists themselves. The finished works were brought down and could be criticized or admired only then. I learned that some of the most beautiful objects in the house and in the tiny garden were Tina's. But no one except another painter or sculptor was allowed to see the work before it was finished, since the outsider might influence the artist's decision or even distort the original intention. One had to decide and choose on one's own. It all sounds so idyllic, doesn't it? Almost utopian. I'm trying to describe those days as I experienced them, not only because they were the happiest days I spent there, but also because it's the only way I can clarify why I feel so sour about that experience today. It all turned sour gradually. Everything turned out not to be what it had seemed. But I should tell you about three more trivialities I experienced before the souring began. The first concerns Ted. He continued to tiptoe to our door and to look in on me every single night. I started to take his modest perversion for granted. If that was the extent to which he satisfied his sexual desires, then I had to agree with Sabina. He really didn't have very extensive desires. I started to feel sorry for him. The second concerns Tina. She repeatedly talked about wanting to leave the garage, just me and you and Ted. I asked jokingly if we couldn't take Jose along, and she explained, no, no, he'd want to bring Seth along, and Seth would bring Vic. And I understood that Seth and Vic would bring heroin, so I didn't pursue that. I asked why we couldn't bring Sabina along, and Tina said, she'd bring Tissy, and Tissy can't live without Seth, and we'd be right back where we started. I didn't take any of this very seriously, and I didn't put all the pieces together until much later. I'm not sure I'm aware of all the pieces even now. The third has to do with Jose. He and I had simultaneously avoided and courted each other since our bout on the street. I worked facing him as often as I could, and whenever I faced him, he turned his back to me. But I knew that whenever my back was turned to him, he didn't take his eyes off me. One day, Seth rushed to Jose, and I overheard him whisper something about Sabina's kid and sister. Jose corrected Seth in a way that struck me as totally bizarre. He said, Ron's kid and Ron's girl are staying right here in Ron's garage, so either say what you've got to say or get out of here. It did become perfectly clear to me why Tina had an identity crisis. She was a dead man's daughter in her living mother's house. Furthermore, if she was perpetually Ron's kid while I remained Ron's girl, it was obvious that I was the girl's mother. I decided to have it out with Jose. I was anxious to learn if he too thought I had walked out on Ron and Tina, if he too thought I was Tina's mother. I also wanted to put an end to our silence, 
to place our courtship on more solid ground. But I didn't have a chance. That's when everything began to turn sour. That night, when Tina was ready to turn in, I told her I wanted to stay behind to finish the work on my own. She could inspect it in the morning and tell me how I had done all by myself. Tina left. A few minutes later, Ted said good night and left. Jose and I were alone. Suddenly, a terrible thought flew through my mind. Ted never went to bed before me. I rushed into the house, took my shoes off, and crept to an alcove in the hallway. I watched Ted come out of his room, tiptoe across the hall, and slip into Tina's room. I was terrified. A few seconds later, he came out and returned to his own room. I ran to Tina's room. As soon as I reached my bed, I started trembling again. I broke out in a cold sweat. I realized that Ted came to our room every night not to look at me, but to look at Tina.